Amen. God bless you guys. Praise God. God bless you as you give today. It is uh, amazing to think we are actually in the second week of Advent. Can you believe that? Uh, Christmas is fast approaching. Yesterday was a very busy day here. I know some of you were here early uh, making ornaments. Others of you were here later in the evening for a tremendous concert that took place. A lot going on. That's just kind of the way uh, Christmas season is, right? Um, But don't get so busy in this season that you miss Sundays here, that you miss time in the Word of God. Amen. Before we get to the Word today, I want to ask you to be praying uh, this morning for the Ormsby family. Many of you know them well. Bob and Norris were members here for many years. Uh, Bob was a a dear friend of my father. He was a faithful deacon here for many years, a part of our deacon trustee board. And uh, after some time in the hospital uh, this past week, uh, Bob went home to be with the Lord on, on Friday evening. And so I was speaking with Norris the other day. She just stated how thankful she was that the family got to spend Thanksgiving together, and uh, the hope that they have today is they're certain that Bob is in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And that's the hope that we have as believers, but even with that, you know, a time like this can be so difficult. So we're going to pray for the Ormsby's. I want to con- uh, encourage you to continue to lift them up, uh, especially this time of year, that God would bring them peace. Amen. So we're going to pray for the family, and I'm going to pray for our time of the word today. Heavenly Father, we uh, just thank you today. Lord, that your word describes a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And so we would ask, Lord God, for the Ormsby family, for Norris and for Mariah and Zakara right now. Lord God, we pray that you would surround them with that peace. Holy Spirit, we believe you're not only our counselor, but you're our comforter. And so we pray you would be that comfort for the Ormsby family, for the extended family, that they would know your peace right now in a very uh, real and tangible way. Lord, as they think on Bob's life, as they remember all the, the memories and all the good that you've done in and through him and in this family, Lord God, we pray that they would understand today that you haven't left them, you haven't forsaken them, Lord God, that you're walking with them even through this. And Lord, as we turn to your word today, We believe it's living and active. Lord God, we believe you desire to speak to your people. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, you would do something in this moment that would would change us, that would shape us, that would mark us as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, praise God. Again, second week of Advent. It is uh, Christmas season. It's it's a season of giving. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to Uh, Those of you who volunteered with Operation Christmas Child, many of you helped to pack those boxes. A bunch of you took those boxes and and filled them up. Because of you doing that, we were able as a church to send out 310 boxes. Amen? 310 boxes. That's amazing. Going to be sent to uh, the corners of the globe. Children are going to receive not only uh, gifts, but they're going to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so thank you. Um, We understand here at Grace Point that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Amen? Amen? And it's more blessed to give than receive. You probably, as you get older, you realize you're not too excited about what you're getting on Christmas as much as the opportunity to give. Amen? Um, and so just encourage you in that. Again, there's plenty of opportunity to still do that through the toy drive, through Walter Hoving Home. Let's be a generous people. Amen? Um, Well, we're going to spend one more week today in the book of Acts. I hope that's all right. And then we're going to go back in Luke's writing to the gospel that was written by Luke. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks in Luke chapter 1 and 2, and we're going to look at some of the songs of Christmas. We're going to talk about uh, one of the most important fundamentals of Christianity. It is the incarnation. The fact that God took on flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe he's not a God who's far off. He is Emmanuel. Amen. He's, he's God with us. He's with us in our struggles. He's with us in our pain. He's not left us alone. Again, the incarnation is one of the fundamentals of our faith. When we talk about the, the Christian faith, there are certain fundamentals that need to be understood and accepted. I, I recently had a, a back and forth with someone who referred to me as a Christian fundamentalist because I don't hide the fact that I believe in the biblical definition of man and woman. I believe in the biblical definition of of marriage. I believe in the fact that all life is sacred and that life in the womb ought to be protected. And so in a conversation, someone referred to me as a Christian fundamentalist and he wasn't saying it in a positive way. It was meant to be an insult. But listen to the definition of the word because definitions matter, okay? And so I looked it up. I said, well, what exactly is a fundamentalist? Listen to this. Someone who believes in traditional forms of a religion or believes that what is written in a holy book, such as a Christian Bible, 
is completely true. I read that, and I was like, that's me, yes, sign me up. I guess I'm a Christian fundamentalist, right? But here's the thing, that same individual who referred to me as a fundamentalist claims to be a Christian that doesn't believe in the doctrine of original sin. Instead, he believes sin is just kind of a a social construct that, that changes with the times. But if you don't believe that man is sinful, then there's no need for a savior, right? And an anointed one, a Christ. If you don't hold to the need for Christ, then can I just say you're not a Christian? There's no such thing as fundamentalist Christian and reformed. Praise God. God bless you as you give today. It is uh, amazing to think we are actually in the second week of Advent. Can you believe that? Uh, Christmas is fast approaching. Yesterday was a very busy day here. I know some of you were here early uh, making ornaments. Others of you were here later in the evening for a tremendous concert that took place. A lot going on. That's just kind of the way uh, Christmas season is, right? Um, But don't get so busy in this season that you miss Sundays here, that you miss time in the Word of God. Amen? Before we get to the Word today, I want to ask you to be praying uh, this morning for the Ormsby family. Many of you know them well. Bob and Norris were members here for many years. Um, Bob was a dear friend of my father. He was a faithful deacon here for many years, a part of our deacon trustee board. And uh, after some time in the hospital uh, this past week, uh, Bob went home to be with the Lord on, on Friday evening. And so I was speaking with Norris the other day. She just stated how thankful she was that the family got to spend Thanksgiving together. And uh, the hope that they have today is they're certain that Bob is in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And that's the hope that we have as believers. But even with that, you know, a time like this can be so difficult. So we're going to pray for the Ormsby's. I want to con- uh, encourage you to continue to lift them up. Uh, especially this time of year, that God would bring them peace. Amen. So we're going to pray for the family, and then we're going to pray for our time of the Word today. Heavenly Father, we uh, just thank you today, Lord, that your Word describes a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And so we would ask, Lord God, for the Ormsby family, for Norris and for Mariah and Zakara right now. Lord God, we pray that you would surround them with that peace. Holy Spirit, we believe you're not only our counselor, but you're our comforter. And so we pray you would be that comfort for the Ormsby family, for the extended family, that they would know your peace right now in a very uh, real and tangible way. Lord, as they think on Bob's life, as they remember all the, the memories and all the good that you've done in and through him and in this family, Lord God, we pray that they would understand today that you haven't left them, you haven't forsaken them, Lord God, that you're walking with them even through this. And Lord, as we turn to your word today, We believe it's living and active. Lord God, we believe you desire to speak to your people. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, you would do something in this moment that would would change us, that would shape us, that would mark us as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, praise God. Again, second week of Advent. It is uh, Christmas season. It's it's a season of giving. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, those of you who volunteered with Operation Christmas Child, many of you helped to pack those boxes. A bunch of you took those boxes and, and filled them up. Because of you doing that, we were able as a church to send out 310 boxes. Amen? 310 boxes. That's amazing. Going to be sent to uh, the corners of the globe. Children are going to receive not only uh, gifts, but they're going to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so thank you. Um, we understand here at Grace Point that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Amen? And it's more blessed to give than receive. You probably, as you get older, you realize you're not too excited about what you're getting on Christmas as much as the opportunity to give. Amen? Um, And so just encourage you in that. Again, there's plenty of opportunity to still do that through the toy drive, through Walter Hoving Home. Let's be a generous people. Amen? Um, Well, we're going to spend one more week today in the book of Acts. I hope that's all right. And then we're going to go back in Luke's writing to the gospel that was written by Luke. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks in Luke chapter 1 and 2, and we're going to look at some of the songs of Christmas. We're going to talk about uh, one of the most important fundamentals of Christianity. It is the incarnation, the fact that God took on flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe he's not a God who's far off. He is Emmanuel. Amen. He's, He's God with us. He's with us in our struggles. He's with us in our pain. He's not left us alone. Again, the incarnation is one of the fundamentals of our faith. When we talk about the the Christian faith, there are certain fundamentals that need to be understood and accepted. I I recently had a a back and forth with someone who referred to me as a Christian fundamentalist because 
I don't hide the fact that I believe in the biblical definition of man and woman. I believe in the biblical definition of, of marriage. I believe in the fact that all life is sacred and that life in the womb ought to be protected. And so in a conversation, someone referred to me as a Christian fundamentalist, and he wasn't saying it in a positive way. It was meant to be an insult. But listen to the definition of the word because definitions matter, okay? And so I looked it up. I said, well, what exactly is a fundamentalist? Listen to this. Someone who believes in traditional forms of a religion or believes that what is written in a holy book, such as a Christian Bible, is completely true. I read that, and I was like, that's me. Yes, sign me up. I guess I'm a Christian fundamentalist, right? But here's the thing, that same individual who referred to me as a fundamentalist claims to be a Christian that doesn't believe in the doctrine of original sin. Instead, he believes sin is just kind of a social construct that that changes with the times. But if you don't believe that man is sinful, then there's no need for a savior, right? And an anointed one, a Christ. If you don't hold to the need for Christ, then can I just say you're not a Christian, There's no such thing as fundamentalist Christian and reformed Christian. There's Christian and there's non-Christian, right? Either you hold to the facts of the word of God or you don't. And so today we're turning back to Acts chapter 21. And I want you to understand that as we turn there, we believe this is not just a good story, but that it was written by Luke and it's absolutely true. This is an accurate history of the early church. Acts chapter 21, are you there? Two of you. Acts 21 Verse 17 is going to be on the screens as well. Let's read together. It says, When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So on arriving to Jerusalem, Paul meets with the leaders of the church there. But notice with me the name. The name is James. Notice Uh, as as well that Peter's not mentioned here. Now, we understand this to be James, the half-brother of Jesus. It it can't be James, the brother of John. Why? Because chapter 12, he was beheaded, right? But this is so interesting because we mentioned it back in chapter 15. We're seeing it here again. It seems that the spokesperson or the head of the church uh, was not Peter. Now, if you grew up in the Catholic church, you were probably taught that Peter was the guy. He was the man, right? The primacy of Peter is a a doctrine of the Catholic Church, and in fact, he's considered to be one of the first popes, but you have to see Peter's not even mentioned here. In chapter 15, James is in charge. James is making the decision, and so the first leader of the church was not Peter, but James, and think about this. Again, he's the half-brother of Jesus. In today's culture, they would say this is nepotism, right? But, but Paul meets with the elders there in Jerusalem, and he, he gives them a full report. He, he gives them a report on, on his work preaching the gospel and going around and planting churches. And in the Greek, there is this sense of the word that he's recounting every single detail. The elders hear this, and, and, and they're thankful. They're excited about what God is doing among the Gentiles. Paul most likely probably brought the elders forward and introduced them. This is the elder from from this area and that area, from each church and each area. And I can only imagine that that inspired some of the apostles who had stayed in Jerusalem to think maybe we should get out of Jerusalem and do something similar to what Paul has done. Sometimes we need to see how God works through another person's life, right, in order for it to, to spark a desire in our life where we say, God, would you do the same thing through my life? And so Paul's excited, he's, he's sharing, but remember we talked over the last two weeks about all the prophecies that said when he came to Jerusalem that he would be persecuted and he would be imprisoned. And in verse 20, we begin to see why this will happen. Verse 20, and when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the Lord. So the elders are excited about what God's doing among the Gentiles, but at the same time, many thousands of Jews have now come to faith in Jerusalem. The the church in Jerusalem continues to grow. More and more Jewish believers, right? And, And so when you talk about the Christian community in Jerusalem, it was made up almost entirely of those from a Jewish background. And these Jewish Christians, these Messianic Christians still valued many of their Jewish laws and customs. And so they say to Paul, well, all these here in Jerusalem, they're very zealous for the law. Now that sounds good, but then we see that there are some that are taking advantage of that fact in order to badmouth Paul, in order to paint him in a poor light. Verse 21, 
and they've been told, here's what they've been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Apparently, the Christian community in Jerusalem heard some rumors about Paul. They heard that he was anti-Jewish, and then he told Jewish Christians that it was wrong for them to continue in the laws and the customs. Listen to their claims. They claim that Paul was telling Jews to forsake Moses, not to circumcise their children, and not to walk according to the customs. Now, are any of those claims true? Absolutely not, okay? Based on Romans 14, verse 4, Paul had no problem with Jewish Christians who wanted to continue to observe old customs and laws. In fact, we saw in Acts chapter 18, right, where he did it himself. Paul himself took a a Nazarite vow. Paul was fine with believers observing old customs as long as they did not think that those customs somehow made them right before God. As long as they didn't take those customs and and put it on someone else and say, well, now you have to do this and this is necessary for salvation. And so the elders say, Paul, what you've done in your ministry is exciting. We're glorifying God. Praise God for that. But we have to tell you, Paul, that your reputation among the Jewish people here in Jerusalem, it is at an all-time low. And so they ask, what then is to be done? Because because they're certainly going to hear that you're in town, Paul. And it's amazing because as we read this, we get no sense that James or the other apostles stood up to the lies that were being spread. Maybe they did, but there's nothing in the text that would tell us that. Instead, it seems like they wait for Paul to arrive and they say, Paul, you you know, people have been talking about you and it's not good and so here's what you should do. They don't say it that way. They say, therefore, do what we tell you. Okay, here's how we're going to fix this, Paul. We have four men who are under a vow. In other words, we've already set this up. Verse 24, take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. So James says, here's what you have to do. And and Paul could have said, you know what, forget it. I'm not, I'm not gonna do that, right? The, the stuff they're saying about me is not true. You guys know it's not true, just I'm not gonna do that. In fact, some people read this text and it bothers them that Paul didn't do that. It bothers them that he went along with this plan because here's the guy who says, you don't need to make sacrifices anymore. You don't have to keep the law in order to be saved or to sacrifice any longer. But here he says to James, okay, I'll do it. And, and you could ask why, right? Why are you doing this, Paul? But I think you really see Paul's heart here in this passage because he knows he doesn't have to do it. He knows that this will not merit his salvation, but he's doing it because he wants to shut down the rumors about him, right? And he says, man, if this will do it, I'm fine with that, right? If this will quiet them down, I'm fine with that. If people are going to say, oh, yeah, Paul's really okay, then okay, I'll go through with a ritual. And to me, this isn't a guy who's going against the will of God, like he was out of the will of God in Jerusalem, and now he's trying to make things right. I I think what he's doing here is just a part of his philosophy of ministry. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul wrote these words. He said, For though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though myself not being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. You see, here's the the beautiful thing about Paul. He never insisted on his own rights. And, And so he's here in Jerusalem and he didn't want the Jewish believers to think that he was against Moses because that might cause them to reject the gospel. Earlier when he was in Galatia, Paul had rebuked Peter, right? Because Peter acted like the Jewish believers were somehow better, right, than the Gentile believers when he's eating kosher and he's spending time with them. And so Paul addressed that issue because he didn't want to offend the Gentile believers. You see, for him, the most important issue was that people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Whether they they keep the law or not, that's not the issue. And so making a big issue over minor doctrines is contrary to this priority. 
There's so many Christians, listen, that'll get hung up on these minor doctrines that actually end up becoming obstacles in the way of those that are seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ. They'll bring up all these minor things, but here's the reality. Listen, if we preach the clear gospel of Jesus Christ and we keep those less important issues to the side, Understand that as people come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will convict them of those issues as they mature spiritually, right? Now, here are these men, and, and, and they're taking a vow. Now, what's the vow they're taking? Well, most believe it's the Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 16. The word Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Nazir, which means to dedicate. And so this was a voluntary offering where you would give God certain things, and you say, God, I'm dedicated to you. And so these four guys had taken a vow, and that vow was going to last for 30 days. Again, Paul himself wasn't taking the vow, but he's going to sponsor these four men, and he's going to pay for them through the ending of the ritual. Likely meant that he was paying for all their days off work. He was sponsoring them that way. He was paying whatever costs were there. And so these men would abstain for 30 days uh, from grapes and grape products like wine. They would abstain from eating meat. They would let their hair grow out, and then at the end of 30 days, they would cut their hair off, and they would take it to the temple, and they'd offer a sacrifice. Usually, you would offer a a lamb for a sin offering, a ram for a peace offering, and and some cakes of flour with oil, and a drink offering. Again, you would shave the hair off your head, and it would be burnt with this offering. And so at the end of their vow, Paul pays for it. Maybe he even helps shave their heads. I don't know. He's involved, right? And it's likely he looked at this vow as kind of a memorial looking backwards, like we do when we take communion, right? When we receive the bread and the wine, we understand those things speak of past events at the cross. And so again, Paul goes through what's asked of him to become all things to all men. Verse 27, it says, when the seven days were almost completed. So the last seven days were the days you would announce, hey guys, my Nazarite vow is coming to an end. And you'd make an appointment, so to speak, with the priest in the temple. So that's the seven days we're talking about here. Now, Paul purified himself as well, according to the scripture here. This could have been uh, what some scholars believe was a a vow or an offering, a a worship service of, of coming in from a foreign land. And so it was a ritual of purification for Paul. You see, the Jews had this belief that if you were in a, a distant foreign Gentile land, you got to be cleansed when you come back to the Holy Land, right? You got to shake the dust off your shoes. You got to get rid of that Gentile dust as you come into Jewish land, right? Okay? And, and so there was this ritual of purification if you spent time in non Jewish territories. And, and so as they're going through the Nazarite vow, Paul was going through this. It says, when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia. Okay, where's that? Remember Asia Minor? Asia Minor like Ephesus, kind of tipping you off to where they're from, right? That's where they're from. It says, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he's even brought Greeks into the temple and he has defiled this holy place. So just think about this. Paul gets to Jerusalem and he finds that people have been bad-mouthing him, right? They're saying, Paul's forgive, forbidding us to circumcise our children, right? Jewish people to circumcise their children. Now, is that true or false? It's false, right? He was never saying that. Paul would say to a Gentile, you don't need to be circumcised. He would say to a non-Jewish person or even a Jewish person, in regards to circumcision, Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes, but he never forbade Jewish people from going through those rituals. He, he said, if you want to go through it, fine, but you don't have to because those things have now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But again, he never forbade them, but he's a victim here of misunderstanding. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, to be known publicly is to be mis- misunderstood. To be known publicly is to be misunderstood. And so here's Paul. He's obviously in the public eye and He's misunderstood by the Jewish Christians, and in order to clear that up, again, he goes to the temple, he's going through a vow, he's sponsoring these men, he's doing everything he can, he's in the temple trying to clear up one misunderstanding, and now the Jews who are not Christians bring a charge against him, right? Apparently, he runs into the same group of Jews that were causing trouble for him back in Ephesus. The same people who followed Paul from city to city to to stir up the towns against him, the ones who partnered with idol worshipers, remember that? They're now in the, in, in the process, now they recognize him in the temple. 
think Paul must have had some very distinctive physical characteristics, right? Because they recognize him and right away they call him out. How frustrating is this? Paul's trying to clear up one lie, and in the midst of that, somebody else comes along and and tells more lies, right? And look at their accusations here. They claim three things. They say, he's against the people, he's against the law, and he's against this place, meaning the temple. And, And here's the thing, those things are not true, but in their eyes, in their perspective, there is some small truth to those things, because most Jews referred to here as the people had rejected their Messiah, right? Paul understood also that Christ was the fulfillment of the law and therefore it's, it's no longer a yoke on the neck of the followers of Jesus Christ. Instead of being led by the law, we're now led by the Holy Spirit, amen? And so Paul's visiting the temple. He has obviously has respect for that place, but at the same time he understands the temple is no longer the way to approach God and it's about to be destroyed as Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. Jesus had already at this time replaced the temple as the place to meet with God and he invites us now, get this, to be living stones now that make up God's dwelling place. The the temple used to provide access to God but now Jesus is our access to God's presence, amen? We have that access. Verse 29, for they had previously seen Tropimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now, when Luke writes this, I think he's very gracious when he says they supposed, (laughs) instead of just saying they lied, (laughs) right? Now, I have a picture here of the temple courtyard. We were just recently in Israel, and we were uh, up on the, the mount there and, and, and walking around that courtyard. It's much different today, obviously. But the temple, in ta- the temple complex in, in that time was about a 35-acre complex. There was the temple, you can see it there, that main part in the middle. You can see there the holy place and the, the inner sanctuary there. And immediately surrounding the, the main place there is what was call, called the court of the priest, uh, also called the, the court of Israel. And Jewish men could go into the court of Israel. That was it, and Jewish men. Now, outside of that was another court called the treasury or the court of the women. Jewish women could go in there, but not into the court of Israel. And then outside of that was the biggest court of all. It was the court for Gentiles. Anyone, including this Gentile, Tropimus, he could hang out there. You and I, uh, the just Gentiles, and maybe some of you are full Jewish, you could go in, but we'd be hanging out on the outside, okay? Uh, and, but here's the thing, as you walk closer and closer to the court of the women, you can see it there, it's represented by a dotted line that goes around there. Uh, what you would come to is, is a three or four foot tall fence. And that fence would run all the way around the perimeter with this inscription on it. Josephus tells us, it reads like this, no man of another nation is to enter within this fence and enclosure around the temple. And whoever is caught, will have himself to blame for the penalty of death that follows. In other words, you're a Gentile, you hang out in the court of the Gentiles. We gave you the biggest court, you stay out there. But if you go past this line, you're a dead man. Now the Jews took this very, very seriously. In fact, they took it so seriously that the Roman officials gave them the ability, they they gave them the permission to execute those who would trespass into the holy place. They could actually kill them, right? And so Paul's beyond the barricade. That's, that's fine for him. It's fine for a Jew to be there. And, and, but at the same time, the Jews had seen Tropimus, the Ephesian, because they're from Asia, right? They're from Ephesus. They recognize Tropimus, and they say he's a non-Jew. But they see him in the city with Paul, and they know this man is Paul's traveling companion to Jerusalem, and so they go, man, Paul must have brought him in. He must have brought him into the court of Israel. That, that guy, I can't believe he did that. Well, it's amazing because they don't ever confront Paul on it. They don't go and ask him. They don't, they don't have any, any real evidence. They, they just suppose, right? They, they suppose. They, and, and they begin to call him all sorts of other names. And so look at verse 30. Look at what happens. It says, then all the city was stirred up. All the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Why were they shut? They want to make sure no other Gentiles are going in there to defile this place. At least that's what they think, right? Verse 31, and as they were seeking to kill him, 
Word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So they grab Paul, they want to execute him, and it's this, this mob scene that's happening here, okay? Uh, defiling the temple. Again, really big deal to the Jews. And yet at the same time, they didn't realize that they were the ones dishonoring the temple by rejecting the Messiah and by persecuting Messiah's servants. And so get this, they dragged Paul out into the court of the Gentiles. Now, Herod the Great had built an army barracks called the Fortress of Antonia, right next to the northwest corner. I think it's in that, if you want to go back to that uh, view of the temple courtyard there, you can see it up to the top left. It was known as the Antonia Fortress. And it was there so that Rome could keep an eye on things and make sure things never got out of hand. Rome didn't take to riots very well. In fact, they executed Roman soldiers who allowed riots to happen, right? And so the Antonia Fortress was there to keep the peace. That's where Pontius Pilate was. When they came to him to bring Jesus to trial, right? They, they brought Jesus to the Antonia Fortress. Picture this, now Paul's in the same place. It's almost like a repeat, repeated story, right? Jerusalem is in an uproar. Verse 32, he, who's that? That's Claudius. Claudius at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Picture this. They're like, oh, okay, we weren't doing anything. Back up, right? And then the tribune came up and arrested him. They arrested Paul, and they ordered him to be bound with two chains. He, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, and some were shouting another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So they're trying to figure out what's going on here, right? Everybody's screaming different things to say, we can't settle this here, bring him into the, the barracks, right? Things got very chaotic very quickly, and most people didn't really know what was going on. Again, it's this mob mentality. And, and so the, the tribune tries to take Paul into the fortress uh, so he can question him. Verse 35, and when he came to the steps... They brought him to the steps. He was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of people followed, crying, away with him. Now mark that down. Because at this point, Paul is bound with chains. And he will be bound with chains effectively for the rest of his life. He'll, he'll have a brief moment where he's released and rearrested later in Troas and then taken to Rome where he's going to be executed by Caesar Nero. But understand this, Jesus himself went to Jerusalem when he was warned not to go to Jerusalem. His disciples, even Peter, said, far be it from you, Lord, you shall not go, right? But we know he went, and he was arrested, and he was taken to the very same place, and the crowd said the very same thing, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. Now here's the apostle Paul representing the same Jesus who was there, right? And they say exactly, basically the same thing, away with him. But can you picture this scene in your mind for just a moment? Here are the, the Roman soldiers in formation around Paul. Their shields are up, their, their swords are drawn. They're carrying Paul down the stairs while the crowd surrounding the soldiers. But as soon as they arrived to the steps of the fortress, the Jews would have backed off. They could not go in there. It would cause them to be defiled. And so it's here in the fortress where Paul's finally saved. Verse 37 as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? Isn't that so nice? Paul's so polite. He doesn't say, hey man, what are you doing? You got this all wrong. Or he goes, can I just speak? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Now, what's he talking about here? Well, the great Jewish historian Josephus tells us of a group of assassins that were called the Sicarii. Sicarii means dagger because these men would go around and they would carry a dagger or a knife and they would mingle in the crowds and they would act like they're kind of part of the crowd and then take out a dagger and they would assassinate people for political means. So these guys were terrorists, okay? Three years before this time, there was an Egyptian who read, led a, a group of 4,000 of these assassins, and th there were 4,000 who were taken together, and they went up to the Mount of, of Olives. And this Egyptian guy claimed he was a prophet of God, and he announced that the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed. And in fact, he said, I'm a prophet of God, and at my word, all the walls of Jerusalem are going to collapse just like Jericho, right? And so the Roman soldiers heard this. They didn't like it very much. They attacked this group of men. They killed a lot of them, most of them. They imprisoned some of them. But get this, the leader had escaped. 
And so Claudius says to Paul, aren't you that Egyptian guy, man? We've been looking for you for like three years. We've been trying to find you, right? And now here you are, right? Uh, Aren't you that guy? But look at verse 39. Paul replied, no, no, listen, I'm a Jew. I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, I'm sure in this moment that Claudius was more than a bit surprised. He thinks he's capturing this Egyptian guy, but then Paul speaks, and when he speaks, he does it with like flawless Greek, right? And so Claudius says, okay, go ahead. You got permission to speak. And Luke tells us this, that Paul standing on the steps, he motioned with his hands to the people. So get this, here's Paul's opportunity. Here's his chance. Remember Romans chapter nine, he said, for I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Understand, his heart is for the Jewish people. His heart is for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And and this is so amazing when you think about it because Paul has just been beaten by this crowd. And all he wants to do is share his testimony with that crowd in hopes that some of them will come to know Jesus as their Savior. Oh, that God would give us that kind of heart. That even those that would come against us and mistreat us, that we would say, oh, I just want you to come to know Jesus as your Savior, right? That God would give us that same heart. It says there, when they were all silent. Don't miss that. It wasn't just a quieting down. I think in this moment there was a silence that was just as profound as the noise that just filled the air moments earlier, but now there's dead silence. Paul is going to say something. He's going to speak, and the crowd's listening, right? And he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And then in this moment, Paul begins to share his testimony. Look at this. Paul's not going to say, now, I want to tell you guys uh, about the prophecies of Daniel and Isaiah and how they're fulfilled in in Christ, right? Let me prove to you right now that Abraham himself spoke of Christ. No, no. Uh, He he doesn't say those things. He's just going to say something that is really irrefutable. He's going to share his testimony. He's going to share what Jesus did for him. I want to encourage you this Advent season to use your personal testimony. Because sometimes we get into these philosophical discussions, we get into these theological discussions, and you have all this pushback, and it just turns into one big argument. But you know what is inarguable? It's your story. It's your testimony. Because it's happened to you. And so you could say, this is what happened to me. My, my life was changed when I was saved. Well, how do you know you were saved? Well, I was there when it happened, right? I've seen what God has done in my own life personally. Let me tell you about that. And, and, and your, your testimony, don't, don't set it aside. It's so powerful, especially if your life has been truly changed. You see, what these Jews are about to hear is Paul's testimony in their sacred language. For years, the leaders had tried to suppress the news of Paul's conversion. They tried to distort the the truth about what happened a few decades earlier. They said, man, Paul went crazy. He's, He's off his rocker, right? But Paul's about to tell them how he was converted. And I can't help but think those leaders that knew the truth, they're cringing inside about what's going to be told. Paul's going to share his testimony. Verses 3 through 21, you know the story well. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it now. You can go back and read it this week. But his speech, it it actually ends rather abruptly because he gets interrupted by the crowd. But I want you to see the very last thing that he says when he's talking about this encounter with Jesus. Verse 21, and and he, he said to me, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus came to me, and Jesus said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Isaiah had stated very clearly, Isaiah 42, verse 6, that Messiah, when he came, he would be a light to the Gentiles. But the Jews of that day were were, were very self-righteous about their exclusivity. Yes, Gentiles could convert to Judaism. They could be circumcised. They could go into the synagogue if they sat in the back, but they would always be considered second-class Jews. And so when Paul mentions this idea of actually being sent to the Gentiles, the crowd is not happy, okay? Instead, they are infuriated. It's a, it's a parallel picture to what happened to Jesus when he preached in Nazareth. Remember, he went to his fellow townspeople, and he, he pointed out that God sent prophets to the Gentiles. And what happened? They want to throw him off a cliff for saying that, right? What, are you kidding me? 
And here's the reality. Jesus still brings division today. Jesus told us clearly how it would be in Matthew 10, 34. He said, do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. As hard as it is to accept sometimes, we know the truth that families are often divided over Jesus. Families are often divided over, over who Jesus is. We know today that our culture is certainly divided over him because he claims to be the Lord of all. And listen, when we talk about Jesus, there's really no middle ground for him. Either he is or he isn't, right? And, and while we have the freedom today not to bow, not to recognize him as Lord, I know this, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, amen? One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But hear me today, we have the privilege of acknowledging that here and now today. And when we do that, man, there's, there's joy. There's, there's peace that comes into our lives because of that. And, and so look at this. Paul's locked in the middle of this battle of good and evil. And, and it looks like in this moment, it, it almost looks like evil's winning, but when we look back, we're gonna see that God had a plan even in the midst of this, that God is working even through these circumstances to bring people to himself. Verse 22, it says, up to this word, they listened to him. This word, what was the word? Gentiles, right? <laughs> That's all he got to say, right? It says the word Gentiles. It says, then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. Wow, what a response, right? Because Paul said one word. We talked about it before that the very religious Jews at that time believed the only reason that Gentiles were made was to stoke the, the fires of hell, to make the fires hotter, right? In their writings, I'm quoting one, to kindle the fires of hell. That's why God made the Gentiles. And so get this, Paul says, Jesus appeared to me and he said, I'm gonna send you directly to the Gentiles passing over Judaism to give them the message of the Messiah, to give the Gentiles the message of a Jewish Messiah? And then he goes and he shares and he's not requiring them to be circumcised. He's not requiring them to keep the law, but just believe in this Jewish Messiah. Now later on, Paul will say that God did this to make the Jewish people jealous of the special relationship that God was working out with non-Jewish people. Because after all, the message was about their Messiah. The message is about a Jewish Messiah. Now the reason they're so upset isn't just because of one word itself, but because Paul is essentially saying is God is sending me to the Gentiles. And what does that mean? It means that they can be saved like anyone else who believes in Jesus can be saved. And it puts these Gentiles on, on equal footing with the Jews. And this is what really made them upset. Think about it. He's saying those Gentiles who you believe were created to make the, the, the fires of hell hotter, they're now equal with us. God's chosen people, they're on, on equal standing with us. Well, that's what he told them, to, to give them the message. Verse 23, and as they were shouting, in the midst of this, they're shouting, and they, they throw off their cloaks, and they're flinging dust into the air. Wow, it's getting really bad out there, right? It says, the tribune ordered him to be brought back into the barracks. He says, this ain't working, come on back in, right? Saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. You see, the Romans didn't get it. They didn't understand what's going on. Why in the world are these people so mad at this? Like, what did he do, right? They, they don't understand the dynamic that's taking place. And so they say, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna flog this man. We're gonna, we're gonna beat him, and we're gonna get the answers out of him. Now, when you talk about flogging, remember Jesus was flogged. And the whip in that time, it was a whip with a short wooden handle leather ropes, often things attached to it in the leather were often bits of glass and metal and bone. And the idea is that when the prisoner was whipped, that, that whip stuck in the flesh and it grabbed and then the soldier would pull the whip back and it would often rip the flesh down to the muscles, shredding the victim, really. Many victims did not even live through flogging. They died or, or, or were crippled because of the blood loss. But we know this, that our Savior Jesus endured that for us. He endured that for us. 
It's the reason he couldn't make it all the way to Golgotha carrying his cross, right? It's why somebody had to help him, right? And so they, here's, here's Paul, and they command Paul to be flogged in order to get information out of him about what's going on. And as they bound him, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, listen to what he says. He asked a question. It's a good question. Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Ooh. <laughs> And when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Now here's the thing. If you said you're a Roman citizen, okay, remember they thought he was Egyptian originally, right? But if you claim to be a Roman citizen and they found out you were not a Roman citizen, you know what the punishment is? It's death. It's capital punishment, right? To claim to be a Roman citizen, if you're not, the, the punishment is, is capital punishment, okay? And Paul there, he says right away, yes. The tribune answered, I bought the citizenship for a large sum. And Paul said, but I'm a citizen by birth. Verse 29, so those who were about to examine him, they withdrew from him immediately. Everybody backed up. I don't want to be a part of this, Right? And the torch and the tribune was also afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. All of a sudden, this tribune's realized, I'm mean, I could get in a lot of trouble <laughs> for what I've just done. Verse 30. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and con- commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet and brought Paul down and set him before him. As we close out chapter 22, understand where Paul's standing. He's facing the Sanhedrin. He's standing before the high priest, Annas, right? Now, the Sanhedrin, Jesus himself, also stood. He also was taken to the Antonia Fortress. He was also stood before the Sanhedrin. And so Paul's life is starting to look very similar to the latter days of Jesus' life. There will be a plot by the Jews to kill him. He's going to stand trial many times. He's going to have many opportunities to share his testimony with others. And and when he's under house arrest, he's going to write the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, also known as the, the prison epistles, right? Listen, when Jesus first called Paul, he, he let him know that he would carry his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Right? And although he's done that to some degree already, now he's on his way to witnessing to even higher authorities. Listen, when we speak of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe it's for every area of society. It's for every social standing, every ethnicity, every culture, right? There's not a man or woman today that does not need to hear the liberating gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul will soon be on his way to testify to the facts about Jesus in Rome, which was the very center of the world's power. In fact, we're going to see he's going to be successful in sharing the facts about who Jesus is with the entire Roman palace guard, right? And although he's in a difficult place, I want you to understand Paul's story is far from over. We're going to get back into it in a couple weeks after Advent. But as we close, I want you to think about the facts that Luke has recorded. We're going to look at some others over the next few weeks. We're going to look at the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin, God incarnate. He came to to live a perfect life, to take our our sins upon himself and to receive the, the wrath that you and I deserve for our sins. He would die on a criminal's cross, and after three days he would rise from the dead, and he would ascend into heaven and send us the Holy Spirit to live within us. Those are the facts that we are called to share. And this is the hope. So often in Christmas we use that word hope, but understand today, this is the only real hope for the world, but it's based upon historical facts. Would you stand with me today? I want you, as you enter into this Advent season, to realize that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that has the power to transform the human heart. And so don't be afraid to share your story. Don't be afraid to to share your testimony. As we come to the communion table in just a few moments, we're going to remember what Christ has done for us. And I want to encourage you, again, this Christmas season, testify to the facts about Jesus. Share your story. Share the Christmas story. As we prepare our hearts for communion, though, right now, let's just take a moment. 
Can we do that around this room? Just to bow our heads, to slow down a little bit, because sometimes we rush into this. But let's slow down and focus in on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. What he did for you on the cross. We know the facts of what took place there on Golgotha. We know what he he did. But I want you to right now think about what a difference that has made in your life. That you know today that your your sins are forgiven, that you're washed clean. That's why we take the, the bread and the cup. We remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. And hear me, I think every one of us can say we need to remember. We need to remember, amen, that we can make ourselves righteous. But Christ has done that for us. And so just take a moment just to begin to thank him for what he's done in your life personally today.